after the disaster that was Fastlane, and again, that show was terrible, god-awful. It left me feeling not only concerned about WrestleMania 32, but it just gave me this feeling that I knew what was going to come, and by God, this was going to be really, really bad. The whole rest of the road to WrestleMania was going to stink, and then the show was going to be one big colossal suck fest. Now, with that said, there was still that morbid curiosity for me as we come to Raw Monday night saying, just how bad is this going to be? How bad is this company going to screw it up? What the hell are they going to do to try and right the ship after that Sunday night epic disaster? All the while, there was still somewhere deep, deep, deep in the recesses of my heart and soul that eternal optimism or hope, foolish or not, that comes with having been a wrestling fan all of these years and a WWE fan all of these years, that maybe the WWE had something bigger planned, had something better planned, and that this road to WrestleMania still had hope and still had possibilities, and that for a show that you're trying to sell over 100,000 seats to, that maybe this company would turn it around at the 11th hour and give us something to be proud of, something to be excited about. It's like a gift and a curse at the same time. Because you know the potential is there. The possibilities can still be there. But you always have that deep down burning suspicion that you know where this is going and you're ultimately not going to be happy with the destination and the results. But my mind. This week's raw with something else. If I could say anything else about this show... The WWE got my attention. I'm listening. And I hope we get more of this. Now you kick it off right away. We're going to find out who's going to get the Vincent J. McMahon Legacy of Excellence Award. And it's Vince McMahon. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, you know, if anybody is deserving of this truly esteemed honor, we're talking about legacies. Let's talk about the game, the King of Kings, the Cerebral Assassin, God himself, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, the 14-time now WWE World Heavyweight Champion, the man who single-handedly eliminated Roman Reigns at the 2016 Royal Rumble to become the WWE World Heavyweight Champion, the man who will go on to main event WrestleMania 32. That would have been my choice. But, okay, it's going to be Stephanie McMahon, you know, legacy, chip off the old block, make it a generational type of thing. That's fantastic. Outstanding stuff, whatever the case might be. It's funny, as he announced Stephanie, I looked at Ashley and I said, you know, if there was ever a time for Shane McMahon to come back, this would be that point and this would be that moment. I just threw it out there because I'm like, it would make so much sense and when you talk about throwing out this segment right away, you need something big. You needed something spectacular. You needed something to quickly shift the narrative away from the disaster that was fast lane and get everybody to pay damn attention and to get everybody excited about what was to come for the next several weeks forward. So out comes Stephanie and you're thinking, oh, maybe we'll get an interruption here from Roman Reigns. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know, here comes the money. Fucking Shane McMahon. Of all people, Shane McMahon. You talk about a legitimate, genuine surprise. You talk about something that grabbed me by the scrotum and didn't let me go the rest of the fucking night and frankly still has it. The return of Shane O'Mac. Shane McMahon is back, baby. And he's rocking Triple H to do better than Triple H is. Gray hairs all the time. But man, when you want to talk about moments, this is the type of shit we live for as a wrestling fan because every once in a while, we can still get those moments. We can still get those things that feel like moments in time. We can still get those things that feel larger than life. We can get those things that make us understand at this moment, we are witnessing something special. This is history being made. This is a big fucking Deal. And to see Shane McMahon rocking his suit and his j at the same time coming down to the ring, this is a moment and you could feel the electricity in the Joe Louis Arena in Detroit. The people knew it. They sensed it. They felt it. And my God, what an incredible moment it was. 
just the whole thought of Shane McMahon being back on WWE television after being gone for so many years, myself wanting him back so bad and at different points in time, begging for him to be a part of a storyline. Here it is. This moment is here. This moment is now. The time has come. Shane McMahon is back. Bang! And what an incredible feeling it is. Nothing but euphoria and joy and sheer delight. And there's nothing that WWE can do, absolutely nothing they can do, to make me feel torn about this, or conflicted about this, or twist me up inside about this in any way, shape, or form. Oh, well, wait. I guess we still have the business of he wants control of Monday Night Raw. Vince says, well, if you control Raw, you basically control the company. But one match at one time. And if you win that match, you get that control. Again, I'm listening. I'm paying attention. This is going to be epic. This is going to be awesome. Is Vince going to say he's got to face himself? Does Shane have to face Vince? It's WrestleMania 17 all over again. Is Vince going to pick this? He's going to pick that. Who's he going to go with? Maybe somebody from the League of Nations. Maybe the whole League of Nations. I don't know, and I don't care. No matter what, there's no way the WWE can get me torn or conflicted on this. And hit Vince anoints an opponent and a time and a place. It's WrestleMania 32. Shane McMahon, with everything on the line, is going to face The Undertaker. Inside hell in a cell. Shane McMahon was supposed to have a match at WrestleMania and win. The Undertaker is supposed to have a match at WrestleMania and win. And they just, no! Damn you! Damn you all, WWE! But anyways, we'll deal with that as the moment comes closer at hand. Let's talk about what else we got on the show. You know, in general, the first two hours of Raw was pretty good. And maybe a lot of that was due to the fact that we had a McMahon family segment that took up a half hour block of the show. And as a result, it pushed a lot of things together, kind of schmazzed them up. But in this case, this week, you know, frankly, you only needed a half hour of Raw any damn ways. I mean, you could throw other things in there. But the first two hours, and maybe again, it was the euphoria and the pure joy, the unadulterated uh, pleasure that came from that first half hour of the show. It carried me through at least through the first two hours. That third hour, the WWE's got to figure out a way to make it better. You know, the ending was worth it, but man, to get from hour two to hour, end of hour three, oof, oof. Uh, but let's talk about what else, again, happened on this show. You know, for a lot of you that are disappointed that either Brock Lesnar or Dean Ambrose didn't win at Fastlane, here's an olive branch to you. You know, it came to the point in time, especially if you were going to do this with Shane McMahon and the fucking Undertaker in hell in itself. At WrestleMania 32, you know, I'm glad the WWE realized that people weren't going to give a shit about the Wyatt family versus Brock Lesnar. That they knew that this was not an appealing option. This was not an interesting option. This was not an option that was going to make sense for any parties involved. It was a true epitome of a lose, 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 lose for every fucking buddy type of situation. You've done enough to build up the heat between Dean Ambrose and Brock Lesnar. So you're fucking going there. The whole thing about, you know... Lesnar attacking Ambrose and then posting it on Facebook. Some might not like it because it's spoiled. But fuck it, I don't care. If you're going to go there, give people an olive branch right away so that way they know that's where you're going. And in this particular case, I thought it was well played. I actually thought it was very smart to do. In terms of Dean Ambrose and Brock Lesnar, you know, I guess this shit can work. And I'm glad that Dean Ambrose isn't going to get lost in the shuffle. And you're working with Brock Lesnar, to me, at WrestleMania, that means almost as much as working with somebody like Triple H, even if it is for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. So now you've got your match, hardcore fans, that you can absolutely get behind, that you could absolutely fucking love. It's going to be Dean Ambrose, and it's going to be Brock Lesnar at freaking WrestleMania 32. And it's going to be a no-hold-barred street fight, and this is exactly what the hell this needs to be. Because in order for Ambrose and Lesnar to pull this match off, it cannot be a standard wrestling match. It cannot be a traditional technical style match. That shit ain't going to work. You built it and escalated it to a point where it becomes a deep-seated personal issue. There needs to be a big type of blow-off and a big type of feeling match and a no-holds-barred street fight, even on the same card as a fucking hell of a cell, works and makes a tremendous amount of sense here. The two things I'm concerned about is, number one, 
I get where they're going with Ambrose and trying to build him up. And in a way, I get it, and I kind of like it in the sense that he's going to get his ass kicked and he's going to keep coming for more. He's going to keep coming for more. But at some point in time, they've got to build up some type of vulnerability in Brock Lesnar. At some point in time, Dean Ambrose has got to get a little bit of the better upper hand on him. He has to. Because otherwise, the dynamics of this absolutely will not work. There has to be moment in time for Ambrose to shine in a somewhat dominant-looking fashion. And then number two, and number two, and this is the key one. This is the most important one. Now that you've got a no-holds-barred street fight, and you've got the chance to spend the next almost month and a half building up the personal issue between these two, there is only one possible outcome and one possible result for this match at WrestleMania 32, and that is this. Dean Ambrose somehow, someway, must go over. There is no point in doing this damn match if Brock Lesnar is just going to win. There is no point in doing this match if Dean Ambrose, who's got a lot of momentum behind him with the audience, goes out there at WrestleMania and loses. It's not going to hurt Lesnar losing a no-holds-barred street fight, especially if the story is good and the story makes sense and the story accomplishes something. And this story could accomplish a lot of many different things. The only way that this becomes a benefit and a win-win for all parties involved is Dean Ambrose must, and I emphasize again, must, must go over at WrestleMania 32. Now again, with the opening segment going a half hour, running McMahon strong, you knew some things were going to be sacrificed as a result this week, and that's okay. Uh, the in-ring action was sacrificed in part as a result in the sense that pretty much almost everything was a tag match. You had, out of the, what, six matches on this show this week, four of them ended up being tag matches. Some made sense, some just seemed kind of thrown together. But again, that's okay. That can work. Now, I know a lot of people are probably excited about the thought of Team Y2AJ. Uh, they're like, this is great, and this is going to be awesome. I don't know where they're really going with this. Are you going to have these two guys actually legitimately team up and go after the straps at WrestleMania 32? Are you using this as a setup, as a ploy, in order for Y2J to turn on AJ and build up to one more match at WrestleMania. That seems, again, kind of counterproductive to me. Uh, maybe that's the direction they're going. Maybe they are going the tag team direction. I just think in these guys' case, there is a better utilization of your resources with both of these guys. Because you've already went there, I don't think t putting them one-on-one -on -one against each other is the way to go for Mania. And teaming them up, most certainly to me, is not the answer and not a, an effective utilization of resources. What I don't understand also is you just had the Titans go over the Wyatt family at Fastlane. Legitimately, literally, the very next night, you get the same fucking match. And now this time, the Wyatts go over here. This is the perfect example, the epitome of this bullshit 50-50 booking that gets nobody over that accomplishes absolutely nothing. Just accomplish nothing. The biggest thing here was Ryback walking off, and now you're trying to do something with him in a single sense. Uh, are you trying to turn him heel? Are you just trying to make Ryback focused about Ryback? I don't. Again, I'm confused because I don't really see the point in it. I don't really see what direction or path that they're choosing for him and where they're going to head with him. You know, it's just it's similar to the Wyatt family, just spinning your wheels. I mean. You look at it, they went from having the Wyatt family eliminate Brock Lesnar at the 2016 Royal Rumble to where now they have to get the grudge match victory on Raw of all get fucking places against Kane, Big Show, and Ryback. Oof. And then they're doing this with Ryback. And this is that 50-50 shit that I just can't stand, and it gets nobody fucking over. Uh, you had the New Day. Your first match of the night was actually the New Day versus Neville and the Lucha Dragons in a six-man tag. You know, I, I'm not going to lie. The match was just fine. Um, anything following Shane O'Mac return, Shane O'Mac being back, was going to get a whole lot of a uh, out of me. It just really didn't fucking matter. And this match, in a way, really didn't fucking matter. I thought it was interesting that the New Day was doing that little pre tape promo about the League of Nations. You know, are you going to actually go with the New Day being babyface? I don't know that they're going there with that. Why would you go with the League of Nations thing? I don't know. It seems like they're setting up to something in, in terms of a big-time schmoz tag team match at WrestleMania 32. My personal hope, again, is that 15 years later, it is going to be a TLC tag match for the titles. 
that's the direction they should go. That's the direction they need to go. Especially when you look at you had the Usos versus the Ascension. You had the Usos go over, but now you've got the Dudley Boys out again. You've got the Dudley Boys doing a change in character. They were one of the founding fathers of the TLC tag match. You know, they're, they're on the roster. You've done a character turn with them. You've got them. You've got the Usos. You've got the New Day. You want to throw in a team like the fucking um, League of Nations? Then do that. You want to throw in the Lucha Dragons? At that point in time, I don't care. Five teams is okay. Maybe three or four would be better, but you could get away with five. If you're going to do a five-team gauntlet match, eh, I don't know. I think the moment of WrestleMania means you got to pull out all the stops. They have no choice. And to me, doing some lame-ass 4-5-16 gauntlet match is not the answer. That's not going to get the job done. Kicking off the show with a TLC tag title match is the type of thing that sets the night in motion properly, is the shit that gets the job done the way it needs to get done. Now, one thing I've always liked about the Attitude Era, especially as we become further removed from it in time, is how everybody always had a purpose. Everybody seemed to always mean something. Everybody seemed to have a character. Everybody seemed to have a direction. And when you go back to that point in time, sometimes the undercard guys would be just as entertaining, if not more so, than the mid-carders. And then sometimes the mid-carders would be every bit as entertaining, if not more so, frankly, than some of the guys in the main event. And the main event scene at that time was absolutely incredible. There was entertainment value all around the show. If you didn't like what was going on in the main event, man, this fucking mid-card feud, these mid-card characters were outstanding. If you loved the main event but didn't like the mid-card scene very much, maybe you didn't like who was the IC champion, you had Crash Holly's 24-7 hardcore rules title defense, and you had all this other shit on the other undercard. You know, indeed. You know, and all this other fun, incredible stuff. But when I think about the fun of the Attitude Era, one of those guys that's jumps out to me at the top of the list, has to be the Godfather. Putting stereotypes aside and this and that, the Godfather was an incredibly fun and an incredibly entertaining character. And, you know, I was always happy for him to be able to find that role, to find that niche, because of all those years of kind of scuffling around, being Papa Shango and being Kama Mustafa and all this other crap. You know, you get to the Attitude Era, they gave him an opportunity to do something that, in a way, was kind of art imitating life. You know, a guy that's running a strip club, and nowadays, you know, he was always bringing out local strippers as part of the... God, I fucking love the Godfather. It's time. Time to roll that blunt and smoke it, bitches. So, you know, I was excited to find out that the Godfather is going to be a part of the 2016 WWE Hall of Fame class. A worthy choice for me, most certainly deserved. Um, you know, I, I'm happy for him. Glad to see he'll be able to take a break from running his strip club or whatever in Las Vegas to be bothered to be in Dallas for WrestleMania weekend. I just hope one thing, and I don't know that we're going to get it. I don't think we will get it. But if we're going to have the Godfather and we're going to induct the Godfather in the WWE Hall of Fame, I hope one more time, one more time, even if it's at WrestleMania night itself that we get one more chance one more opportunity to say this time once again for everybody to get on the train now I will say this in the interest of fairness I really didn't care much about the Sasha and Naomi match I was just wondering what they were going to do in terms of starting the ball rolling to getting Charlotte towards Sasha, Sasha towards Charlotte at WrestleMania 32. I figured they're probably going to throw Becky Lynch in here and make this a triple threat. And for the NXT heads, this is glorious and this is great. And you know what? Those ladies hopefully will be able to go out there and deliver the goods come April 3rd. Me personally, I still like the thought of it being one-on-one. -on -one. I'd still rather have Charlotte versus Sasha. Becky's had her opportunity. Sasha has not. So as a result, give me Charlotte versus Sasha. Divas title, WrestleMania 32. Ric Flair in Charlotte's corner. And Snoop in Sasha's corner. This isn't hard to figure out, damn it. 
Get Becky Lynch the hell out of there. Put her in the Divas tank. She had her moment in the sun. She had her opportunity. I know, like I said, a lot of the NXT heads are going to beat off to this triple threat. But damn it, I need Ric Flair and I need Snoop and I need them in at least one God Blessed segment together. 15 minutes, anything goes, before WrestleMania. That's not too much to ask. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not the only one that had that morbid feeling of dread knowing that the main event match for this show was going to be Roman Reigns versus Sheamus. However, I'm sure I wasn't the only person that said, well, we got to get through 10 or 15 minutes of this high highfalutin garbage that we're not going to care about to get to the point. And the point being is that God is the WWE champion and God is main eventing WrestleMania. And if Roman Reigns thinks that he's ready for God, he's got another thing coming. Oh, God. God was magnificent. God was glorious. Praise God! And all praise go to him. He beat the piss out of Roman Reigns. Just wailed on him. Destroyed him. So much so that it led Byron Saxton to say, Here you go, Roman. Whether it was a blade, a blood capsule, who the fuck knows? Who the hell cares? Probably a blade. He got the job done. He got the message across. He got the point across. God showed why he's God. And Roman Reigns is, he might have his own empire, but it has nothing on the kingdom of heaven. That's for damn sure. The one thing the WWE needs to be careful of here, and I am not here as your prophet. Yes, that's right. You, you, you. I am not here to question the wisdom of God or the vision of God. Or the path that God is choosing for Roman Reigns in this story at WrestleMania 32. But I do have concerns. They cannot go down the underdog path with Roman Reigns. You're already fighting an uphill battle. Foolish or not, you're fighting the uphill battle. In part, you've created that situation. The underdog shit isn't going to work. You have to go the badass route with Roman Reigns. That doesn't mean that Roman Reigns beats the hell out of Triple H every single week. But that means every single week, Triple H does something, Roman Reigns does something, and it's some type of stalemate. It's some type of standstill. Because if you continue to beat down Roman Reigns week in and week out, the fans will probably get even more behind Triple H. And that's not the direction you want to go. If you go with Triple H beats him up one week and then Roman Reigns destroys him the next week, then again, that's that 50-50 booking that is going to push people more towards God. Than Roman Reigns because at the end of the day when shit gets to get when all things come to pass God has two decades of history in the WWE that's not an easy thing to overcome if you're somebody like Roman Reigns and you're trying to ascend to that top spot that's a lot to contend with there are a lot of deep-seated loyalties and strong feelings for God sometimes on the negative but a lot on the positive as well and it's going to be incumbent upon Triple H to make this work it's going to be incumbent upon God himself to show everybody the path, to shine the light on everybody and help them see what needs to happen and what's going to go down. But they must, they must be careful on the path and direction and choices that they make. Because either A, you're going to end up with a situation similar to WrestleMania 22, where the guy that you're trying to crown as that next generation is getting booed out of the fucking building. And no, that whole defense logic that's been used for seeing it is about well, he gets a reaction, and that's all that matters. No, at some point in time, your character has to get the right type of direction, especially if you're clearly trying to point him in that direction. Now, I think some of the shit in terms of the hate for Roman Reigns is childish, petty, and fucking ridiculous, especially since Dean Ambrose is fake, fucking facing Lesnar at WrestleMania now. He's got a big WrestleMania match. He's got almost an equivalent WrestleMania match. And this whole thing of wanting to shit on and boo certain guys that aren't certain guys is the type of counterproductive bullshit that doesn't get anybody over to the level they need to get over. For all these people talk about how they want new stars built, you know, at some point in time you need new stars of all different types and all different ilks, and just to sit there now and pick and choose and say, I don't want DK, I want DK, I don't want DK, I want DK. We're acting like a bunch of fucking six-year-old kids. It's time to fucking get over it. You know, the, the whole thing is I get it and I understand it. But the WWE, more importantly, has got to get it, and they've got to understand it. They've got to make Roman Reigns badass here. Not badass as in, in an over-dominant type of, there's no fucking reason to get him behind him way, but badass enough to where people want to get behind the guy because, overall, he's fucking badass. 
And there is a badass element to Roman Reigns, and it's time to emphasize that. It's time to go with that. A little less bromance between him and Ambrose on the road to WrestleMania. A little more badass. A little more. But it's a balance and it's a tightrope because if you don't make a badass enough, people are going to see the badassness of God and they're going to flock to him. They're going to get behind him. If you make Roman Reigns too badass, then people are going to, again, flock to Triple H and they're going to get behind Triple H and they're going to really resent Roman Reigns. It's a very interesting tightrope that WWE is going to have to balance the next several weeks because they can get it done right. I don't care about the fact that they're going to be in fucking smarky cities for Raw on the road to WrestleMania. I don't give a fuck. You can do it right, and you can make this work, and you can make this a successful angle. But just having Triple H beat down Roman Reigns the way that he did, in my opinion, is not the way to get the job done. It made for a good finish, yes. It made for good television, yes. And once again, praise God! You want to talk about the big leagues for Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 32? He's going to find out about the big leagues. The WWE's got to be really, really careful here. But a good show this week. Other than that little bit of a lull that you were naturally going to hit in the third hour, this is one of these examples of where you truly wish the show was only two hours. Because, man, if this was only a two-hour Raw, this probably would have been one of the better Raws that I've seen in some time. After the disaster that was freaking Fastlane, like I said, above all else, the WWE accomplished one thing this week. They got my attention. And I'm pretty sure they got yours, too.